it's phenomenal. Uh, growing up on the East Coast, I, I see this stuff on TV and the History Channel and stuff. When I go out and I find these things, there are people who just look at it as graffiti, you know, and, and there are people who are like, what's the big, I'm like, you don't understand. This stuff has survived between 400 and 1,000 years. It has meaning to the people that were here. There's a message there. And Sears Point, to me, is a bucket list anywhere in the United States to go see the largest, most beautifully preserved petroglyph wall I've ever seen in my life on any video from, even on TV, I've never seen anything like Sears Point. Hi there, Dean. Thanks for joining us. How are you? Well, I'm doing great. It's a pleasure to be here. You made a farewell to Arizona, you know, post. So like, how did you, how did you feel about it? About, uh, letting go of Arizona. I mean, you know, everything there is to know about Arizona. Oh, not even close. It was uh, it's bittersweet. We we've went over, Oh man, at least over 200 different locations in the last four years, put 44,000 miles on my Jeep. I had a great, great time. Met some great people, saw some great locations, but I saw it as an opportunity to expand. We just started making it a little bit of a business where people would call or get on a zoom with me and find some of these hidden locations instead of going to the same old tourist attractions in Arizona. Right. And, and you know a lot about the history of Arizona too, though. So how did you come upon all this history? I moved to Arizona in March of 2012. Arizona was celebrating its 100th birthday when I entered the state. Right. Wait, it's only, it only celebrated its 100th? As being a state, yes. It was a territory <laughs> since uh, 1863, but uh, Valentine's Day of 2012. Yeah, I said the same thing. So when we got here, I just started looking around and looking at the history and started visiting some of these sites. And, you know, it always happens like this. I kept telling people that I worked with these places that I was going to, and they lived there their whole lives. And they're like, never heard of it. Never heard of it. And it was like 30 miles away from their house. Yeah. So the more I kept talking about it, the more I'm like, hmm, and then I got hooked on reading book after book after book on the state of Arizona. Mm -hmm. But for, for those who don't know you yet, Dean, explain like, how, what is, where does all this even come from? Your passion, your obsession with history and state history and finding all these untold stories. Like what brought you to that? It's about the only subject I was ever good at was in history, loved history, lived in North Carolina, studied all the Civil War history, went to every battlefield I could possibly find every weekend. I just, I, there's, I can't get enough of it. And a lot of people know the East Coast of the United States and the history there. But a lot of people, they don't think Arizona or the Southwest has any history because it's such a young state. I'm like, well, the land's been here for as long as the Earth's been here. So we just don't cover it mm -hmm. as much as we do on the East Coast. So the more that I was finding in Arizona, the more people were getting involved and, and, and my business started picking up and people wanted me to take them out to these places. Mm. And it's, it's, it's just a pleasure. I used to do tours on my own in uh, Yorktown. We lived in Virginia. I was stationed there. So we would take people over there to there and into some of the other Williamsburg and take them through there. And they're like, do you work here? And I'm like, oh, no, no, no. We just, I just do this for fun because it's hard to find people that are knowledgeable, that are free. And I'm here today, so I'll take you around the park and show you around. You know, a lot of these, um, these pioneer cemeteries, you know, it's like when you see them on there, it doesn't seem like anybody's been there in 100 years. They seem like they're in danger of having almost washed away. You know, there's a profound stillness and maybe sadness about the places. I mean, what's it like when you're walking around there? And who are some of the people you're looking for, you know? That is interesting uh, because today... I just went down the road in Waco and went to a cemetery. And the way the cemeteries are kept up here on the East Coast, well, not the East Coast, but more on this side of, of the United States, especially here in Texas, they are clean, kept up, cut, it's grass. When you think of the desert, you got tumbleweed, you got weeds that you've never seen before, everything has thorns on it, and you got dust, dirt. And these places were mining towns. You know, a lot of these places were places where people picked up back in 1870, 1880, and just completely vacated. And when the towns came back, like Globe, Arizona, and Superior, Arizona, those are still mining towns as of today, but they were thriving in the 1880s and 1890s. 
and people are going back to these cemeteries and starting to clean them up. I've been to man, at least 30 or 40, maybe, maybe 35, good safe number of pioneer cemeteries. And they blow me out of the water. I mean, from the herbs. Yeah, to, the white white herbs wife, you know, she yeah. that that cemetery looked very um uh I mean her plot looked like it was kept up but i was struck by that there were all the other plots so we know nothing about the people who lived and lived them you know yeah the only reason that that cemetery is even known or on the map there's no road in or out of it is that tunnel national force is now part of what what encompasses that cemetery there and we know in the early 90s two major motion pictures were made about the herbs and somebody said it out loud you know maddie blaylock herb is buried somewhere out here and uh, everybody started going out there and there was this this people started coming together and they're bringing trucks out there and they're making this makeshift monument to maddie blaylock herb mm -hmm. and tunnel national forest got a hold of it came out took it down people were upset but they were like look this is a pioneer cemetery everybody in here deserves you know the same recognition and not just one person so they they went up the, out there and they put up a nice fence around it they cleaned it up and actually that site where I took that picture, her grave is probably about 50 yards back of, of where that actually is. So people can come in, see it right up front, not mess around with any of the other graves. It was smart of Tano National Forest to put that there and say, okay, boom, come here, take your picture. You've seen the site, now go ahead and get out. But you know, I have a question because I'm from the East Coast and you were talking about you're from and originally from the East Coast, right? And so Jesse is a west coast guy i mean he did live on the east coast but yeah, i was born in and, new york but uh yeah I'm well but you spent most of your life out here i'm just saying i don't think of you as a east coast person but yeah. you think there's something about the spirit of the west coast that it's rougher like you know it's true like an east coast all of the cemeteries everything is just protocol and we go back 500 years and the pilgrims what's accounting for this difference in this particular vein that you're talking about right now well, not becoming a territory until 1863 so new mexico and arizona they were both considered one territory at the time and then you get the people in the expanse the 49ers coming out for the gold rush you get people getting land that that's a huge thing when when land starts being offered because they need people out there and you're out there by yourself you know you're out there by yourself so you have a lot of you'll come across i've come across family cemetery after family cemetery in the middle of nothing. You'll see rock formations and stuff of where people used to be buried. And people always ask why the rocks? It's because when you dig down, you can only go so far into that kind of earth right there. And you have coyotes and wild animals and everything around there that can easily dig up. So they always pile rocks on top of those locations. But you know, everybody settled on the East Coast and there was really nobody living. Uh, the Native Americans were out here but it wasn't a thriving metropolis in the 1850s and 60s and 70s in, in any of these areas. Now, you, a lot of the other herps are buried out there, aren't they? No other herp, just one in Arizona, and that's Warren Earp in Wilcox, Arizona. And that cemetery is the most unique cemetery I've ever been in because it used to be underwater over time. If you look at that land from a satellite image, you'll be like, what's all this white sand? As you get there, it's like a beach and you have the tumbleweed. And you have the, the vegetation of a desert growing in there. And you have really old warped wood signs on the ground and, and barely standing. That particular grave site sticks out like a sore thumb in there because, you know, people came back and they put this big steel monument in this cemetery. And it kind of takes away from that cemetery a little bit. Now, how do you even hear about something like that place or an old mining town or, a, you know, how do you because it's like this history is everywhere, but it's nowhere, you know, right? It's research. I'll tell you, I've spent thousands of hours now. I'm not kidding. I don't want to go to the same old tourist places. So when I would go to hidden places in Arizona, and it's, it's weird how Google works, because I've hit that same key and that same search for four straight years in a row. And all of a sudden, other places will start popping up. I find books. I'm a big used bookstore. They had a great one in Phoenix where I just dig through some copyright dates of 1930, 1940 and start going through this stuff because people found it, but it got lost to history because wow. nobody else cared to right. read the book and remember it. So all I did is take all that 
so you'd read across a book, they'd mention something and then you'd try and track it down. What was the hardest one you ever had to track down? Like, well, Maddie Blaylock Herbs was, was, you know, that's, that's a two timer. I, I never really had had to go 70 miles, one direction, go off roading, try to find something, leave, go back home and then come back again. The Corona spy satellite targets, those things are amazing. But if you don't have a GPS, if you don't have the exact pinpoint and location, you'll never see them. Right. What are they? Tell us what they are. In 1959, the government launched the Corona spy satellite program where they launched these spy satellites in the space, spy on China and all these Russia, all these places. But they needed a, a, a way to calibrate the cameras on the satellites. So what they did is they came out to uh, Casa Grande, Arizona, back in 59. In around 1960, started placing these targets, and they look like these huge crosses from the air. These like they look like Maltese crosses, actually. They placed 272 of those in a 16-mile grid, and they're exactly a mile apart from each other. So when the satellite flew over, it would beam a beam to it had some rebar sticking out of it, and that would be able to calibrate the camera to go and take the pictures. It remained top secret; nobody knew about it for over 30 years, because nobody was living in that part of the desert, they would be 15 to 20 feet off the road. But they were so they, they were so flat across the surface that you, you can walk right across, you could be 10 feet away from it. If you don't see it right when you get on top of it, you're just gonna walk right by it. And so we we tracked down about 15 of those. Now, how did you how shots. did you track them down? Like, good old Google Earth. Well, so so the first thing is you came across it. Yes. somewhere in an yeah, I started, article i found an article and i'm like spy satellite targets in casa grande so I, I looked it up i found out what they were all about there would be an article here or there about somebody who went out there and saw it and some of them would give the exact gps location mm -hmm. so you put that into google earth and then it, you wouldn't see anything and then you just take google earth for hours and you go across that land up there and you start spotting them. I want to ask you something about your background, Dean, because I think you were in the U.S. Air Force, right? Before yes, I you. Was. Yeah. So how does that, thank you for your service, first of all, are you bringing in some of that into doing this work? Because it's, you're so precise about what you're doing and very strategic. So how do you, yeah. what skill sets do you bring with you? Yeah, no, it's, it's more investigating. That wasn't what I was doing in the Air Force. So yeah, it's just more, it's, it's, it's a hunt. And if you have a hobby or a passion for something, you're going to hunt for this stuff. Sometimes my wife is like, what are you doing at midnight? And I'm like, well, <laughs> it's the best time to do it. Everybody's sleeping. Right. And I'm just, that's almost why I have to wear the old man glasses now, because I was constantly trying to find these places. And when I found them, then I had to find these little markers on the road somewhere. So when I pulled over, I knew I was where I needed to be at. Okay, well, I'm going to give you Jeffy's phone number because the two of you in the middle of the night can be hunting down. He'll send places for you. For, sure. in, you know, well, once you move on from Texas. We all have our obsessions, different obsessions. But Yes, uh, we do. How many people do you travel with when you're looking for a place? Normally, it's just me. Yeah. Normally, Are you go alone? Are you scared? I mean, you've gone to some pretty uh, creepy... There's some, there's some things I did that were stupid, yeah. I'll just say this. I'm married to a phenomenal woman, and she'll she's like go out and just do this stuff and uh i, so I notice she says go out and do it she doesn't say let me join you no she doesn't you'll never <laughs> see her in any of these videos i think she went one time right. and she had enough yeah and and she was following behind the jeep i was up on this big cliff and i'm like please come this way you're you're yeah. being a great hell by so i don't have to walk all the way back yeah well there's a lot of like snakes and weird yes. stuff yeah. you know what Tarantulas, i mean tarantulas snakes scorpions yeah. things that you never thought you would do. we have um trying to remember the correct name for these wild looking pigs we got out here oh really uh, javelina yeah 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 those those are the worst nasty things that i've ever come across those are dangerous me. yeah what, did you, what, what happened when you came across that as long as they're not with a with a group you're okay normally they told me just like a rattlesnake people are like what about the rattlesnakes i said rattlesnakes are phenomenal yeah. because they tell you Unless you mistakenly step on one, they'll tell you be way before you get there. The hair in the back of your neck stands up and yeah. they're like, yeah, you're not going to go that way. We're going to take the path around it because we can't see him. Yeah. But he told us he's there. And we've never had a bad encounter with a snake. 
Now you always have the dark glasses on. Is that part of the, is that to protect your eyes out there? Yeah. It's just beat sun is always. Um, so is it like you always have to do it with these boots? You know, do you have a, a particular kind of thing you're wearing when you're going out there? Cause how long are you out there for? Oh, hours and hours. if yeah. not a day. It, it also looks like you're out there at the height of the sun. A lot of times. Always. You gotta use your sunglasses. It's, you know, it's, a hat. it's. I'm wearing a hat in your honor, just to make it's, sure. It's uh, Arizona. People, people always are like, oh, it's so hot. I'm like, look, it's like anywhere else. You have to deal with humidity in certain places. You deal with heat there. So when it was 115, to me, that was the best time to be on the trail because nobody was out there. Now, when you're going to go and explore like a Native American site and all that, how do you kind of deal? Because it's really incredible that you're doing that. How do you do that? And do you need? you know, permission or how does that all work? And what has been your experience with that? A lot of people ask me, especially here in Texas, because 98% of this land is owned. Arizona has a lot of uh, Bureau of Land Management out there. And that is, I love those people because you can camp there for 13 days without moving, without any pass rate. They just make sure you're going in that spot for 13 days. They have preserved land. Agua Fria National Monument is one of them. They preserved I don't know how many hundreds of thousands of acres of the most ancient Native American land that there is out there. And the reason that it became a protected area is to save that stuff. But it doesn't stop anybody from going on the land. What it does is it puts rules and regulations out there, which I try to tell people constantly is if you think you're alone, if I, if you get lost out there, I, you just lose hope. It's an unbelievable area. They do not have roads in there. They're just dirt. Uh, you don't go out there when it rains, so they make it tough on you. But you will find some of the most ancient ruins out there, but they also have people that look at them once or twice a month to do reports on them. There's always a camera on most of these places that people are like, what are you talking about? Like they're just like for wildlife, they have the camera and the high brush. It goes off when somebody passes it. You pick up a piece of pottery and you don't think anybody's looking. You're going to be paying about ten to twenty thousand dollars, and you're going to it's a, up to a year in prison. So it's not worth just go out there and leave it alone, enjoy it, um, yeah. and just and, and that's what we try to get across from, to people. But even on places like Agua Fria, people get very upset that people mm-hmm. are out there looking at this stuff. Oh, They're we get I get uh, the comments get ugly, starting with Native American heritage things out there like going to any of those ruins they're sacred to them we shouldn't be there and i'm like this is the reason they preserved this because if they didn't over time these could disappear right. um but but i always like to tell people we show these things but very rarely do we ever give directions to these things and they're not hidden because national parks national monument areas sell books and i always show the people that have an issue the books that i purchase but the thing is this you have to open up the book understand the map and hike 10 miles in one direction. And hopefully you find it and your car is still there when you get back. So there's a lot that goes into getting out there and finding these things. You can't just go off the side of the road and say, boom, look at these beautiful petroglyphs. Now, what are you thinking when you see one of these petroglyphs? Like, oh, is they're thousands of years old, you know, it blew. It, it's phenomenal. Uh, growing up on the East Coast, I, I see this stuff on TV and the History Channel and stuff. When I go out and I find these things, there are people who just look at it as graffiti, you know, and, and there are people who are like, what's the big? I'm like, you don't understand. This stuff has survived between 400 and 1,000 years. It has meaning to the people that were here. There's a message there. And Sears Point, to me, is a bucket list anywhere in the United States to go see the largest, most beautifully preserved petroglyph wall. I've ever seen in my life on any video from even on TV. I've never seen anything like Sears Point. Now you have such a wide interest, like you're doing that, but you're also looking at POW camps from Arizona, yeah. which is, you know, the, during the second world war. So how do you, and what do you find when you go there? Is that history preserved? Uh, yeah. Well, I'm actually going to be interviewed for an Amazon Prime video coming up soon uh, because of the this research I've done on Popical Park POW camp. Really, most of the people who live there never knew it, it was a POW camp. Back in the 80s, I did a video showing that they had a ceremony out there and uh, they put a placard out there. And over time, somehow, some way, that historical placard, if you know how those are put onto a monument, they are really cemented in. Somebody stole it somewhere around 84, 85. And so it disappeared. 
So there are three things that remain out there today. There's actually pillars by an Army National Guard building. There are four pillars to an old guard tower. There is the uh, Officers Club, which is now the Elks Lodge for Scottsdale, Arizona. That building used to be the Officers Club. I stood outside of it to take pictures, and somebody was looking at me, and they're like, what's up? And I'm like, oh, no, I, this is what I do. I said, you know, I know in the hallway there, there's one facsimile map of what this place used to look like. I read about it. And after a while of talking, we, he opened up the door for me and we went in there and we saw that facsimile. And then there's the famous POW escape back in 1944, where 25 German POWs escaped Camp Papago. And on the Crosscut Canal, they were doing a, a news thing. I came across a minute and 45 second news thing on one of the channels in Arizona. And the gentleman wrote a book about it. And they were standing on the Crosscut Canal, but they never showed why they were standing there. So it took me a little while of researching where they were at, what house they were behind, what color the house was. And as I walked out there, they were actually standing on the tunnel where they came out. And on that tunnel is a, it's a, it looks like any other manhole cover, but on the manhole cover is the story of how those 25 escaped. And it was the largest POW camp escape on American soil during World War II. So there's, there's a lot, I did tours there too. So people don't have to do what I do and work, you know, 10, 15 hours to find a tunnel. Now, what about the story about the aliens in the 1890s? I mean, what, where did that come from? How That's did a you Texas find... story. Well, okay. How do you yeah. find something like that? Again, just, just going wild on a search engine and, and typing in things that aren't normal, you know, all kinds of history. I don't want everybody's top 15. And it's amazing is if you keep doing it for hours and hours and hours, other things pop up and uh, that popped up. And just uh, you don't have to have him give his trade secret away. I'm well, no, no, this. you know what it is. It's like the <laughs> petroglyphs and people getting upset with them going to see them. I always tell people, even if I give you the location, good luck. Yeah. And if you think that it's for people to go out there and destroy, well, those people are going to have to do a lot of research, a lot of work, risk a lot of stuff, be outdoor people and get to these places just to destroy yeah. them. What was the story? Yeah. In 1898, I believe it is in Aurora, Texas, there was a UFO sighting and I am zero of a UFO guy. I have a buddy who does a podcast. I go on there because he knows I am the guy on the opposite side, but the story is so compelling that something happened. Definitely. I'll take this one. Something happened in 1898 on a farm, something fell out of the sky at six, six o'clock in the morning. And when it fell out of the sky, it hit a windmill and busted it to pieces. And then it crashed into the ground. And when the, the people came out to look at it, they saw aluminum, something that looked like metal. It was just scattered all over the place. But what they found, and you can read the articles in the paper, what they found was remnants of the pilot. There was a military gentleman there uh, and he's like, this, this is not of this world. This, the, whatever this is, this is not one of us. So they took him uh, or whatever it was, took it to the cemetery a couple of miles down the road, the Aurora Cemetery, and buried whatever it is into the ground there. And over time, there was a couple of tombstones that just showed up and those tombstones disappeared. And now they put this huge boulder there that weighs a couple of tons so that nobody can take the boulder out of there. So you can go to the cemetery and, and, you know, Texas is huge on the historical markers. I've never seen, bought a book on like a, over 2000 of them. And to walk up there, it says this place is famous. One of the reasons it's famous is because in 1890, 1897 or 1998, a UFO crashed and the individual, the pilot is buried here in this cemetery. And, wow. um, you know, the History Channel, I watched the thing in 2019 when they came out. They ran radar underneath there to see if anything was underneath the ground. And it shows just like anything else in that row, somebody who would be about six feet long is underneath there. And people are like, well, why not dig it up? And Texas has a state law where it's had it forever. You have to have next to kin approval to, to dig anybody up in any cemetery. So... I guess we'll never know. About the people that you either would come with you on the tours and now you have incredible following, you know? And so who are all the people? Do they come from different backgrounds? Yeah. Do they have different ideas? Yeah. Are they- Unfortunately, like, yeah. the Arizona stuff caught on just as I was leaving. We had trips coming in from England that got a hold of me. And wow. I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. 
I'm not the guy that has the tour bus and stuff like that. I'm a guy that has an orange Jeep and you will follow me and I'll take you to these places. And they're like, well, let's, let's figure it out. And I'm like, well, unfortunately I won't be there, but yeah, we have people, mostly they want the pioneer cemetery stuff. The other one was, and to me, this is number, this might with the, with the petroglyphs, this might be number two all time was NASA trained uh, 67 and 68 for the moon landing up around Flagstaff. And they made two crater fields. One had over 427 craters in it. They called that uh, crater field two. And crater field one had 139, and it was set up just like the Sea of Tranquility. They took the photos that they had from the Lowell Observatory, and they went there, and they made them look exactly the same. And they were all up there, and every astronaut that stepped foot on the moon trained up in that location. And what had happened to crater field number two is that the off-roading vehicles used to go in them and destroy them all. Oh, There's just wow. a handful of them that you can see from the top. So I'm like, what about this crater field number one? It was by myself. I was coming across bear track after bear track in this gravel. And I was like, man, when you step into this, this volcanic rock, you're going four to five inches every step. And it's about a two mile hike through it. Then you go through these beautiful pines. And then on the other side, you come to what is crater field one. It took me two times to get there. I wussed out the first time. And then I went back a second time and the U.S. Park Service and NASA got together. And years ago, they roped off that area. And you can walk through it, but the vehicles can't get through it. And if you go out there, it's stepping back in time. There's nowhere else on this planet that has this. And this is where they all trained. This is where they brought all the TV cameras just in case they couldn't get the footage in 69 of Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin on the moon. They were out there filming them training in this location just in case. And what was it like just walking through the field there? Oh, I just, and you know, you go there in the winter because it's the best time to go because it's like in the forties up there, but the sun still burn you. And you have the snow on the San Francisco peaks behind you. And then you have the snow in the craters and you have all this black, black rock and you're just walking through there. And I tell people, they're like, I have taken a few people and they're like, eh. I'm like, eh. I'm like, understand where you're at and the reason that they did this. And then look at it from above before they went. It's like, look at what they did with the city of tranquility and look how they pretty much matched it exactly in crater field one and most people don't know about that because it's on the other side of a landfill it takes two mile hike through the cinders well it'll take you about an hour and 45 minutes to get there it'll feel like you skied in lake placid somewhere on your thighs yeah wow it's, it's incredible the stuff you get to do i guess you you built your own world essentially to be able to do what you want you know and, and i know you you have big plans i think you want to kind of hit a lot of states, right? Is that the future for you? You know, the Serpent Mound was a bucket list. So we uh, went to Ohio and hit the Serpent Mound. And uh, there are just other places throughout this country that unfortunately are going to the, to the wayside because nobody has a clue. Tell us what it is. It's a snake effigy and it curls, it coils. The head it looks like it's holding some sort of an egg and it aligns with the summer solstice. It aligns with all kinds of celestial things, mm. and they can't figure out how people thousands of years ago that created this thing could have been so precise, and it's meant to be seen from the air. It's yeah. not, you would never, you walk over, it's a hill. It's yeah. a long, goofy-looking hill, but where they have it is one as a crater area where a crater hit thousands and hundreds of thousands of years ago. It's off of a cliff area. It's in a perfect, absolutely perfect position. Amazing. Yeah. So Dean, tell us people that are watching, listening, where they can find and look at your, your TikTok channel and where to find this work that you're doing. Trying to change the name, is just very hard. Everything is found at the Arizona Timeless Tours. I'm on the podcast, the TikTok, the Facebook, the YouTube, every, I got seven platforms. And if they just type that into any one of those, they'll find all of my stuff. Well, you know, for now, stay, you know, people will follow you around. You can start in Arizona and leave a little trail but thank you so much yeah, um, thank you with your next adventures and we'll all be following along as we i go. appreciate it thank you yeah, guys thank you Dean.